All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and start my introduction and people will probably still roll in um, over the next several minutes. But um, so good morning or good, good afternoon, I guess everyone. So my name is Sarah Grassi. For those of you that don't know who I am and I'm the outreach manager for Comet. Um, thank you for joining us for our May webinar today. And hopefully you will see some of you, all of you again as we continue this monthly webinar series over the rest of 2022. Um, and that will focus on a large range of topics um, related to Comet's research goals, such as technological advances and seafloor mapping, operational applications of hydrography, safe navigation, and beyond, um, and education, as as today's presentation um, will will focus on. So, um, I'll drop the links to our website and social media newsletter, YouTube channel, where all of the webinars are are archived um, in just a just a minute. So now I'm going to hand it over to our director, Dr. Steve Morowski, so he can introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Leslie Souter. Um, and after the presentation, we're going to have plenty of time for discussion. So please just utilize the chat or the raise your hand feature to participate. Um, so Steve, all you. Thanks. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our um, speaker today, uh, Dr. Leslie Sauter from the College of Charleston. Um, Dr. Sauter is on the faculty of, of the College of Charleston and has been the uh, leading force in the BEAMS program, which you'll discuss in a few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as background, she has her PhD from the uh, University of uh, South Carolina, um, also uh, an alum that Sarah is um, in micropaleontology. Um, She's been doing quite a bit of work with NOAA uh, relative to the, the BEAMS program and encouraging undergraduates and I think graduate students in terms of um, their longer term career aspirations as far as uh, uh, working in the, the ocean exploration and uh, marine mapping uh, realm. Um, I can say based on the most recent ocean sciences meeting, she had quite a cadre of, of students participating and a very impressive uh, set of experiences all around the globe, which is pretty incredible. And I noticed on your website, you've got a map of all the places that your your students have traveled to, and it's it's uh, pretty much a life list of all the places I want to go. You know? oh. So, um, you know, she's been very, uh, she's been very entrepreneurial in terms of working with both uh, government and industry in terms of um, getting students experience learning and also doing some really incredible um, work in terms of both uh, uh, typical multi-beam mapping but also uh, ROV dives and whatnot so uh, um, and, uh, and this is um, this is uh, folded back into her uh, education program and as uh, as Sarah said, you know, we're, we're very interested in expanding the education program as part of our center. And so um, the types of things that that Dr. Sauter has been working on, in particular, the closing the gap as far as uh, habitat characterization is something that is very central to the program we have here. And so we're really happy to have Dr. Sauter um, present here today and, and hopefully we can get into a, a pretty good back and forth in terms of, of questions and answers. So with that, um, Dr. Sauter. Thank you very much, Steve and Sarah. Um, I'm going to share my screen, get set up. So we can get rolling. Sarah had asked me to mention sort of my pathway to where I am now. And as you heard, I did my PhD in micropaleo, really doing some uh, early work with Bob Thanell on uh, modern planktonic foraminifera as a tool for understanding climate change and did that for a while started here 32 years ago at the college of charleston in the geology department and did a lot of different things i have a real passion for teaching coastal geology studied with miles hayes who just sadly recently died um, but also uh, just loved the teaching i taught teachers um, learned a lot of methods to teach and one of my favorite things to do was to go out to sea with students. So we started getting some ship time with NOAA because they have one of their ships, the Nancy Foster home ported here. So we just hopped on board and started doing that. And one of those cruises led to their, uh, one of my former students became the Foster's first survey technician. And another student ended up going to NOAA learning marine survey and went to work for Keras. The, most of you have probably heard of that, that software company. And he called me one day and said, you need to teach this. So he came down, taught me, taught students, 
And that was in 2006, and we uh, employed our new skills out at sea. And all of a sudden, I became a seafloor mapper. I, I don't call myself a hydrographer. I've never taken a single course in hydrography. Um, but I have learned the software pretty well, and that's what I teach. And you'll see how I use it here and what the BEAMS program is and also what it isn't. So um, with that, uh, I guess the message for any PhDs is you never know where your career path will lead. Uh, but it has been a great journey and I couldn't uh, be more thrilled with the path that resulted from all the differences. And really it was out of a love for going to sea and I'm able to take students out to sea still. So. Um, let me get going. So the BEAMS program, it's just a convenient acronym, <laughs> Benthic Acoustic Mapping and Survey Program. We started out calling it CMAP, but NOAA has a CMAP program, so they asked us to change it. So now we're the BEAMS program, and the students who complete it are called BEAMers. And in 2007 is when we officially started after having done a fully dedicated cruise on the Nancy Foster shown here. Um, and I would love to say that maybe uh, two thirds of the students who went out to that sea are still doing marine survey as a career. So it's a very strong um, uh, recruitment effort to be able to take them out to sea. And my colleague Scott Harris here at the College of Charleston, um, he and I both have been engaged in building this program. Uh, I did a sabbatical at the University of Washington and started the program out there with Dr. Miles Logston leading that show. And until his retirement in 2018, they had an active program and we had some nice collaborations. Some of our students were, went there and some of their students came here. But sadly, it is no longer in existence. Um, takes a, a particular type of director in order to do this program and you may see why in the upcoming slides. So first of all, what is the program? It's really a series of courses. It is targeted undergraduates because that's the body of our students here. Although some graduate students have taken the program and have done very well, of course, in it and they've chosen to do their theses. Um, and a couple of students have stayed on and done their graduate work here too. Um, but basically it's targeting undergraduates it can, we can accommodate pretty much any student in geology and marine biology. Those are the two programs or degree programs that uh, deliver most of the students and I'm in the geology department, but we also have minors in environmental studies and geoinformatics as a new program. Um, but basically the program is to teach skills in mainly software for conducting geoscience. And it provides, we want to provide many opportunities for our students uh, using this new skill for research, getting them out into the field, providing internship opportunities, and hopefully professional development in the way of presenting their research. What it is not, to be clear, it is not a degree. Um, it's technically not even recognized as a program here. <laughs> it's kind of strange. Yeah, if you go to the College of Charleston website, it may not even be there. So this has really been kind of my baby. I founded it and I've been the, the uh, teacher throughout and Dr. Harris has taught a few extra courses along with me. Um, but it is not a program or even a concentration. That may change. We hope it will in the near future. And it certainly is nowhere near a Cat A or Cat B certification program. So just to be clear with that. Um, so just to tell you what it is and how we approach it, uh, there's a lot of coursework, not a lot. There are some courses that involve training of software and hopefully getting people out to see as part of a course. We have all the students conduct research using the tools. We have every student when possible, except for COVID, of course, present at a professional conference. We try to get every student out at sea with a dedicated cruise. And if we can't do that, we try to get them as volunteer survey techs on other cruises. And we are increasing the internship and volunteer opportunities, mostly the internship opportunities because those are paid. We've been very successful with that. So those are all while a student is in the program as an undergraduate student. 
So the coursework, there are really only three foundational courses. We require every student to take marine geology or an oceanography class, so they are at least exposed to some of the science because they're going to need to utilize that science when they do their research. Um, and we have two courses utilizing Keras, HIPS, and SIPS. Intro to Seafloor Mapping, we call CMAP, is a half semester intensive course where they learn all the bells and whistles and a little bit of the theory behind um, hydrography. As I say, I'm, I'm not a hydrographer, so I don't go too deep into that. Um, <clears throat> and we call that CMAP. And about two thirds of the students who take that course opt to go on into the next level, which is the seafloor research class or nicknamed the beams research class, where they utilize the, uh, the software to conduct individual research. Um, so we call them beamers if they've completed these three classes. And if they only get to the CMAP level, we call them wanna beamers. <laughs> so the other coursework that we can occasionally um, offer is an advanced ocean survey class. It's taught by an alumnus who uh, is at the US Army Corps of Engineers locally. And so they learn a, a variety of new skills um, another alumnus has done a side scan sonar class. We hope to offer that again, but we also have this new geoinformatics minor in computer and data science. So more and more students are starting to do those uh, classes. We have very strong GIS department, not department, but a group within our department and remote sensing. We try to get all the students to take GIS. We offer geophysics occasionally. That hasn't been a very popular course, um, mostly because of timing for our students. Um, and then we are hoping to offer more and more field oriented electives locally where we can get them out in small boats on a day trip or an afternoon and get exposed to the hardware and utilizing the, and, and gaining new skills that way. And then many of our students who take the foundational courses early conduct some kind of independent research. And that's where Dr. Harris, Scott Harris, uh, comes in uh, much more strongly with the research and he'll have some uh, students work with him out in the field or on some of the work that he's been conducting. Um, we also have been able to offer many training workshops over the years, uh, mostly software where, um, Con not Kongsberg, um, Chimera has been taught here and IVA software, SonarWiz, uh, HIPAC, those groups have all come voluntarily to teach our students. It's been really great, the partnerships we've developed with them. And once in a while, some of the technology, one of our local alums has just acquired um, a multi-beam system with his company. So he's gonna start introducing, we don't have our own, we, we have a small boat, but we don't have a multi-beam. Um, but we try to get as much hands-on experience as possible. But the real strong point of this three course sequence is the research course. We use existing data um, from archival sources, mostly using NOAA Okeanos Explorer data, sometimes Nautilus. Uh, all of this is deep sea. The, reason, the main reason we choose deep sea is that the data quality can generally be not so affected by sound velocity corrections. Um, and it's just really exciting, some of the stuff that we work with. Once in a while, we get out and we collect our own data on some of those cruises, but the bulk of the work that we do is from archive data. And from that data, you know, we generate an image and then the students figure out what they want to study about it. So it isn't that classic um, type of research. You ask a question based on the data you have instead. So some of the areas, these are all just snips from student work. All of this is undergraduate level. Some of these are even freshman and sophomore projects, but we have spent a lot of time <clears throat> studying the Blake Plateau. In 2018, I was fortunate enough to go out as one of the, I was the geology lead on the Okeanos Explorer of, on their first expedition in this region off the coast of South Carolina, Florida, you know, the southeast U.S. coast. Um, and they have conducted many cruises since with ROV dives. And of course, they have mapped about 90 percent of the Blake Plateau that was previously practically unmapped at any kind of high resolution. So we had great new data. We had ROV dives to excite us about it. 
And uh, so we've spent a lot of time looking at deep sea coral mounts that uh, we have a lot of marine biologists, so this is wonderful for them and we can do some habitat characterization, which I'll talk a little more about. Um, we also do continental margins. We have some great uh, areas that we've studied along continental margin. And then some of the features of the Blake Plateau that again is offshore, still technically part of the continental margin, but much deeper and with the canyons and scarps. And then some of these major geologic features that are found right outside our back door, the Blake Spur, which is shown here with no vertical exaggeration, is quite a massive piece hit with almost a, a four kilometer drop there and the Blake Ridge that is also beyond the edge of the Blake Plateau. We've done tectonic features. It's great having archived data. You don't have to go there, pay for it. You can just get, get the data. So fracture zones and back arc areas. We had a Mariana Trench one, but it kind of lost the data <laughs> in the deep part, as you know. Um, and then we also have a lot of students work with seamounts, especially because of the deep sea coral interest um, many of these ROV dives have encountered rich habitats for deep sea corals. So some of the things that we study are where these habitats might be, where the next dive could be. So lots of different types of studies. Students get to, I give them every, every semester. I'll have, by the way, I only have about eight students each semester in the research class. There's <laughs> plenty of work. And um, so we give them a bunch of options and they pick a area that looks of interest to them. But every student does their own uh, research study. It's just that we as a group work through the steps of the research together. Um, so once they get their surfaces all generated, then they begin the important part, the interpretation and characterization of the geomorphology. And so we look, we use a lot of the tools with Keras, um, probably not the way they intended them to be used, but it's great. And we look at geomorphic variability. We uh, have them use slope surfaces and classify backscatter intensity so that they can compare areas that were dived on with ROV and then identify other sites that have the same slope characteristic and uh, intensity, usually high intensity. So. And even if they don't, we really want them to understand the basics of backscatter and how it can be used and how to um, utilize it in the software itself. And then I require all students to do some form of quantitative data. Um, even if it doesn't come up with any great results, they have that exercise, which is really important for undergraduate students. But some of them have ha found really interesting things. A student uh, was looking at continental margins off of Norfolk and saw a strong relationship pretty much at all along the sites that he uh, characterized with uh, backscatter intensity and slope. So we looked at other areas for that same relationship and didn't find it. And here we do index, we, we develop these shape or uh, shape indices for coral mounds and look at their differences or similarities. And so a lot of things like that. And some of our students have had uh, the ability to go to Ireland and collect their own data, including huge uh, bed form sand waves off of the southeastern part of Ireland and characterize and quantify these, um, the peakedness, the wavelengths, the heights, et cetera. So some really cool studies have come out of the exercise of working with quantitative data. As I said earlier, we, we definitely want to have the ground truth. So we choose sites. Um, that have some sort of ROV dive so that they can look at them and characterize them and then uh, do more with that ground truth. And some of the students go on and do an independent research and this student, Haley Drennan, she looked at a dive track of the ROV and uh, classified all the different biota along the different parts of the dive track and compared that with the substrate variations. 
So basically all the researchers, all the research conducted is looking at seabed characterization and geomorphic analysis. These are the types of posters that are generated um, each semester, again, up to eight sem per semester. And they all include bathy slope profiles, backscatter, usually classified backscatter, some form of quantitative data, and now the ground truth. You can just see a variety. These were all presented at the Ocean Sciences meeting virtually, <laughs> um, as Steve said, in February. Some of the students opt to do a story map. You're probably all familiar with story maps, so I'm not going to click on this and just for time, but uh, they've taken the same information that has already gone onto a poster and just reformat it into a story map. And then at some point we get every student at a professional meeting. And so you can see we've taken uh, over a hundred. Well, I don't even know how many. It's certainly yeah, well over a hundred students to professional meetings since 2013. The infamous New Orleans hydro survey. I swore I'd never take students again to New Orleans and damned if I didn't do it later too <laughs> in ocean sciences. And of course, when we got up to COVID, um, we were at the 2020, uh, where is it, 2020, oh, right here, Ocean Sciences, and right after that, the world shut down. So the next meetings were all virtual and very unfortunate for our students and not the experience we had hoped for. We had uh, 15 students presenting virtually at Ocean Sciences and I realized that was not enough. So at that point in February, I decided to have our own conference. So we had the 2022 first of many, hopefully beam symposium in April, a two day. And we did it off campus to make it feel like a real conference. We had some money from eTrack to help support us. They, by the way, if you're familiar with eTrack, they have hired, we think 13 people from my program. So they love us and we love them. Um, but at this conference, we had 23 students presenting. Most of them are shown here with me in our beam team shirts um, and 24 posters and three talks. But the wonderful thing about this is we also had a total of 72 attendees who came on short notice really to recruit our students. We had 35 industry professionals, 20 of whom were alumni of our program. So everybody knew about the BEAMS program who came here and it was just a, a fabulous time. The students were just riding cloud nine after. And as a result, every student who presented, who was seeking an internship, many of these students didn't graduate yet. They, so in fact, one of them is a freshman, um, but every single student got some kind of internship or a job if they were graduating and not always directly from this, but certainly a few new internships and jobs were um, were filled during this time. We also had programs who wanted to display their stuff and we had let them have a lightning talk. We had several alumni who were manning the tables or womaning the tables and uh, we had some wonderful receptions and we even had a live interaction with the Okeanos Explorer because two of my students were on board. Shannon Hoy is one of the lead mappers and Trey Gillespie was an undergrad with me and is doing his master's now. So that was really exciting to connect with them. And so save the date, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna add another day to it so that some of these groups can host some very short workshops and do a little more on the recruiting side and we hope to get more graduate programs to come in and recruit our students. Um, each year we only graduate maybe uh, six to 10 students in the program. So it's worth coming to meet the students who are still matriculated here and have them look at grad school in the following year or apply to grad school. So I encourage you all to think about that. Um, as I said earlier, the reason I did this is I want to go out to sea with students. What a fulfilling experience that is. It's so much fun. Students, of course, get so much out of it. And we've had uh, ship time and the Nancy Foster 
and oh, I thought I had the years there, but basically, oh, I do, from 2007 to 2013, we hope to get some time back with them in the future. But then we got some funding from local sources from the college to support us for two and three day, actually up to four days on the RV Savannah, which is out of Skidaway. And that was even better because the students ran the show completely. But these are dedicated beams program, multi-beam sonar, et cetera, mapping cruises. And on those cruises, of course, we do some our, some of our own ground truth. If we have a ROV, we've been able to deploy that, that we get on loan from others, UNC Wilmington. We do grab samples. We've done uh, sub-bottom profiling and, of course, side scan sonar and CTD. So it's incredible um, experience for them as they're learning the acquisition side of multi-beam sonar. And Kongsberg, by the way, has been extremely generous to us uh, loaning us the EM 2030C. So we wouldn't have been able to do it without Kongsberg. Um, as I said, internships, we get more and more of different groups on board thinking of our students as summer interns to come there and they're rise when they're rising seniors, get experience and uh, get to know the company and for the companies to get to know the students and a lot of NOAA um, groups very successful for their their internships this is my son who did it years ago and he's been with NOAA for 12 years and she's still with that's Christy Fandel who some of you may have worked with but incredibly valuable to have these experiences uh, oh I already showed that <laughs> Oh, I'm going backwards with my, wait a minute, I was hitting the wrong button. <laughs> there we go. So just to, uh, this is sort of my bragging slides. Since 2007, we've had 205 students complete that three course sequence, meaning they've gone through the research. And of those students, 61, uh, of the ones who have graduated, there's still plenty who are here, 61% have entered the marine geospatial workforce. So that's a pretty high percentage for any program for students to opt to pursue that career. Um, and they're all over the place in private, government, and academic positions. And one of my favorite statistics is almost half of those people who have gone into the geospatial workforce are women. So we are really infusing women into this industry. And Steve mentioned the map. This only goes up to 2017. So add a few more dots to each of these colors, but the students really have gone everywhere. And this is just either during uh, an internship while they're still matriculated or within a few years after when I, because I, I have a huge database. I know where all my students are and they stay in touch. It's, it's a wonderful group. But the most important stats is 100% job placement. Any student who wants to pursue this field gets a job. And, um, you know, I mentioned the conference. Several students already had jobs by the time of the conference because people come to us early. And so if you're looking for a student, contact me. Um, program growth, we hope to keep growing it. We hope to um, get a certificate or at very least a minor in marine geology that would include the BEAMS program as a track. We may or may not get our own MBES and multi-beam sonar, um, but we do need to establish annual ship time. And it doesn't have to be in the deep sea. We hope to have uh, those shorter day trips established and to expand our partners. Um, now that you've seen all the things we do, I want to mention we have never had a research grant. I've never applied for one. And by the time I wanted to do that, they, you know, it was already a well-developed program. Um, and we don't even have a budget within the College of Charleston. I don't get an annual budget. So anything we do has come from partnerships and actually very few programs contribute money really only one at this point has contributed significant money and that's where we've been able to do the bulk of our work but groups like kongsberg loan us instrumentation noah has been able to give us ship time and so we've worked the you know we've worked the industry to convince people it's worth the time to invest by 
in-kind donations to the program. Um, now we have a huge uh, alumni base out there, and so we have been raising money from the alumni. That money goes straight to student professional development, either to support their tra travel to a you know to a conference or to a ship, or to support research in the field. Um, so we have a very nice cushion for students, but we still are going. One of my jobs in the next two years is to increase. Um, donations from private industry to support the program. Um, oh, I hadn't clicked on that. We also hope to do some more telepresence teaching, which we're now pretty good at <laughs> due to COVID. Um, and I've been working on a website with my former grad student and a current grad student, Explore the Seafloor, utilizing not only the maps that we are generating, but also the incredible video and I think I have time. Let me see how we're doing. It's 1230. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to open up this website. It is um, it's on a blog platform and it'll probably stay there, but I haven't really advertised it. But this is an example for one of the dives from the Okeanos Explorer expedition that I was on where we can have interactive GIS maps overview dives, uh, an overview of the dive. This is looking at just one dive. Um, a lot of sort of teaser images. We look at the site location within the, the area and then some of the maps. And then the other thing that we do, well, let me just briefly show you what this kind of overview is and it won't be high resolution i don't say well i could probably make it high yeah you may not hear the sound but that's okay um i'll just skip ahead so we we have these banners and all the data are from let me turn it down all the data come from all, all this data come from the chat rooms that are occurring during the live telepresence. So our students learn from building these types of documentary kind of highlight videos. So this particular overview takes a six hour dive and condenses it into 12 minutes. And then what we are building, what I'll be working on this summer more is to expand the research. This is where all of the recent student work and anybody else's will go there. So under research, we're gonna look at the Eastern US continental margin and you can go even deeper, but these are sort of thumbnails to get you and give you an idea of the posters that have been produced and these will all be available for anyone to download the poster or to look at the story map directly or I poster we've used in the past as well. And then within this, uh, we have those posters are also categorized by the type of geomorphology. So seamounts I mentioned earlier, we have lots of seamounts that we have worked with over the years. And then also, we have a lot of marine biologists, so for night area, we want to look at the research slides. I don't have all the research slides yet, but I wanted to point out that we also um, have these biota highlight movies. And so here is where we go through the dive and document all the observations of a single biotic group. And this one ended up being almost 20 minutes long. And this kind of work really excited the, they're not narrated, but they are uh, annotated. I'm not going to go through that. Just show you some of the video from it. So if you're familiar with the Okeanos work, you know how incredible these video are. So as a result of having done some of those videos for this website, this semester um, I hosted the first <laughs> Explore the Seafloor course where we had nine marine biology and other students 
Let me get out of this. This. Yeah, marine biology and other students, and we created 25. Um, we had nine students, 25 highlight videos of different biota on six different dives. So it was really fun. We're going to do more of that. Here's again just those screen grabs. And that that course is called Explore the Seafloor or X to C for short. I shouldn't say that on a recorded video. So just some of our collaborating partners. Uh, E-Track has been incredible. They are pretty much our parent organization now, but all these other groups have contributed in kind or with some dollars. Blue Dot and Global Coast Survey are both uh, companies located in Charleston that are owned and run by alumni of the BEAMS program. So they are now giving back a lot and working with our students more and more. So it's really exciting to see that, but all of these companies have also hired our students. So before I close out, I just want to make sure that anyone out there who has a PhD knows that we have two positions that are open right now. One is just a one year visiting assistant professor of geology position and the duties of that person would be to teach at an introductory level and there is no follow up if if we like you we keep you that kind of thing so we just want to make sure people know that this does not lead into a position um, and if you're interested here is the website and i can give the link to sarah to distribute the other thing though is that i'm retiring from full time this summer we did a search this past year and we were unsuccessful so we are opening it again, and this time we are going to include the uh, assistant level, but also the associate tenured level. So that's what we're hoping. We don't have final approval, so we don't have the announcement out yet. It should be announced later this summer. But the tasks of this tenure track or associate professor um, would be to teach the upper level marine geology class these you know the courses in the beams program um, and to know at least the software so that they can teach the uh, cmap and beams research classes and hopefully expand what we can offer i didn't know very much more than what i taught so um, so in the first two years the that person would teach these two uh, well, two types of courses, and then in the third year, they would take over the directorship of the BEAMS program as I will be fully retiring at that point. So it's a, a, if you're interested, please contact me. Here's my information, and I am more than happy to take some questions now if you have any. Well, thank, thank you very much, Leslie. It's a very impressive program, and, and it's really great to see how um, you've been able to bootstrap this program into something <laughs> that's actually yeah. quite, quite consequential, you know, for for undergrads. And um, it's a lot of um, issues that my colleagues and I are exploring right now in terms of, you know, how do we recruit graduate students? How do we expand our program and whatnot? And um, I actually would make the offer that, you know, we, we have the opportunity to maybe collaborate on some things. Uh, first of all, I think um, the, the next two years we're going to be doing a lot of mapping related work uh, and and characterization and and uh, we have some bunk space available, uh, including July. this July and next July. Okay. Next July will be up in your area, right? Really? So, um, we're we're going to be surveying from the Keys all the way up to North Carolina and yeah. so um, you know, we'd be uh, more than happy to entertain a couple of students on that, or you're welcome to come. Uh, <laughs> so I um, wouldn't take a birth of a student. No, <laughs> uh, I, I think we yeah. might even have extras, so I, I don't think it would. But uh, we, you know, I, I just see um, tremendous opportunity for collaboration with you all. And, and to the point of uh, we're looking for a graduate student right now. So mm -hmm. if you got anybody that's uh, an undergrad that's um, in that program, that um, looking for a place to start graduate studies, uh, we got a project for you fully funded. And that would be to start in the fall. Correct. Right? Okay. Um, 
They are I, probably, I don't mean to put you on the spot right now, but it's... Right, right. No, uh, Sarah had mentioned it, and I think all of our recent graduates from this year already have jobs, but the very few go straight into graduate programs. They like to get right. the experience. But there are probably some out there who have been out in the industry for a few years, and that might be just what they need is a little carrot like that. So if uh, you want to send me the information, I will distribute it. I've just updated my uh, email list from having done the conference. So I know where everybody is. <laughs> right. that, that's good. Um, and I was impressed that you were um, tracking so closely um, the outcomes of your students. And it's very impressive that you've been able to keep them in the fold. Um, so um, I have a, a few other comments, but my colleagues are jump chomping at the bit here. So um, <laughs> Allie, I think you were first and Sarah second. Okay. Hey, Leslie, thanks for the Hi. talk. It's fantastic Hello. to see what you, you guys are doing and been doing. Um, it, the kind of, just the amount of um, work you've put in over the years, it can really come through how, you know, how de well developed Beams is now. It's fantastic to see. Uh, so I have sort of two, I guess, two questions. Um, I was really fascinated to hear that, that um, you guys don't really offer a, you know, a a CAT A or a, even a certification in hydrography, um, which, you know, and but yet you're still working with all of the big players, Kongsberg and these guys. So, yeah, I, I, I guess my question is more of a comment, but it's, it's have you ever had feedback from Kongsberg and those people, any kind of pressure on you to, to move towards that CAT A or have they always been happy with you just being a kind of a, just a s survey mapping teaching kind of uh, unit? Well, to my knowledge, no one has ever been kicked off the job because they didn't have it. Um, I think the the real benefit of the program for a student coming out of it is they have the knowledge of, of doing science and doing the work and they're very trainable. So they learn on the job whatever it takes. Um, literally only three students have gone through CAD A training in all these years. The reason we don't do it here is um, we'd have to hire other people. I couldn't I couldn't teach it. Um, not only because I don't I wouldn't have time, but also I don't have the background to teach it. And that's just not where the emphasis is here. You know, we have our, our niche of training that's very different and others who do the CAD A and B very well, they they're going to continue. <laughs> Thanks. That's really insightful. I think it's something we're kind of grappling right now. So it's yeah. quite interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, well, I, I, you know, uh, the highly quantitative nature of the CAD A and CAD B frankly scares most of our students away. We've had yeah, people yeah, come to USM to say, oh, you need this, this, this in, in calculus and they're not going to do it. So um, they might in graduate school, but as an undergrad, it, it really is not a way to recruit undergraduates, <laughs> believe me. So. Cool. I mean, that's, it, it's, it resonates with me because I, I know I, I've got a history in C4 mapping, but I've never gone through the hydrographer route either. And um, mm. I would feel very uncomfortable trying to sell myself as a cat <laughs> kind of <thought laughs> yeah. And My other quick question was to do with telepresence, and that's something we're also talking about in Comet um, a lot. Do you see Beams moving fully towards a, you know, a full telepresence mode ever, or are you yeah. always going to use chips? No, we actually, even during COVID, I still came in and taught them. It's just that I couldn't go right to their desk and work with them like I normally do. But we have a wonder, what I would suggest is you have a room with, where each student's computer can project to a monitor. We have a nine monitor wall video display and so I could see what everyone was doing without being next to them. Um, that room, all that same strategy could be used in telepresence teaching for sure. But I personally have no interest in ever doing a telepresence <laughs> class ever again because of COVID. <laughs> right. Awesome. Um, my last comment was just that I really like the look of your Explore the Seafloor um, website. That, oh, was, that was great. And I actually in my my last institute, I taught a, a higher level undergraduate course. It was called Exploring the Seafloor. So <laughs> I was like, wow, this is like almost identical to what great minds look like. <laughs>
that's great. That's great. Thanks so much, Lucy. Thank Cheers. you, Alex. Somebody ripped off somebody, but I'm not sure who. Hey, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you don't call it X to C, though. I don't call it X to C, no. And you're not allowed to. I coined Trade that. Mass. <laughs> Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Leslie. I have like a million things I'm going to be emailing you about, but um, I, I, my first question was actually kind of related to what um, Ali just asked. It was about if if you guys had any COVID adaptations that carried over that you actually ended up really um, liking using. Um, but as you mentioned, that you know you kind of still came in. So you're no COVID is. COVID well, actually, the only thing that I realized was a very good tool is when a student is having difficulties, which, of course, with the research class, every student is doing their own research. They can ask their colleagues or peers, but they, for the science part, I really have to work one on one with them. And so using Zoom, I could be at home. They could be in the lab and I could help them that way. So that I will continue to do. I don't have to come in to work with them. Mm -hmm. They can just um, share their screen instead. Gotcha. So that was good to know. Great. Um, my my other question was um, a little bit maybe in, in going into left field, but um, as part of the program, do your students do any sort of community, like broader community engagement, um, you know, in terms of education with either formal or informal educators? Because you guys have all this great imagery and, and these cool resources like what you showed on the new website. But, um, you know, how how might you guys use that um, with the, I, yeah, so like more public outreach and. Um, and well, that's what outreach. I'm hoping the Explore the Seafloor website will generate because I've been frustrated with NOAA. They don't have the time to attract people with this incredible video. Nobody knows where it is for one thing. And then the, the seafloor imagery is amazing um, from the multi-beam. Uh, but locally, haven't done that much just because I'm a one person show pretty much here. And But that is definitely my passion to get the word out. So when we have career fairs or whatever, or students coming to the department, we'll have something in the hallway, but we're going to have a touch screen monitor for students to explore on their own, but I wish we had more. Thank you know you. that that's a, one of the uh, one of the problems of uh, government agencies. They do a jo good job collecting things, collecting, but they're so damn busy collecting things yeah. that they never actually harvest the yeah. scientific, you know, interest of it all. And so I think having a mining operation like yours is is really a nice niche you know and mm. i would assume that noah would want to encourage a lot of that and so oh they encourage it <laughs> i just don't support it <laughs> i'm hoping that they will start providing some resources other than their archival data but gotcha. that's another thing that i will be able to spend a little more time on next year after i reduce my teaching gotcha. um matt and then ali i think yeah, hey, thanks, Leslie. Um, I think echoing others. Um, <laughs> really nice to, to see you and and um, and get the get the tour of the program. I know we've sort of um, obliquely interacted a bunch over uh, over the last several years um, with with you and your students. I know. Um, I think you've got one out on Okeanos right now. Is that right? Um, um. Um, College oh yeah, as a in, as an intern, Margaret Hanley. Yeah, um, it, we one of one of Allie's is is out there as well, um, so they're oh, probably right. getting to know each other um, <laughs> out at sea. And and I know we've um, we've come this close, you know, I think three four years ago to to getting a couple um, of students that, um, at that time, a Homer hires, I think, mm -hmm. um, and then like we we got weathered out and. Or he had a grandma die or something or both um and um but yeah we've we've had this interest oh and um uh i know we we provided some of our data to sean munson um i think maybe a, a couple of years ago um yeah. like a, a shipwreck that we the surveyed shipwreck, and, yeah. Uh, yeah i was going to post to a picture of his work too because that but that wasn't in the beams research class he did that as an independent study yeah. Yeah. now yeah, he's no, done some was, great work was, yeah, that was really neat and and uh, fun to see stuff that we'd collective come alive um, in in a different way. So yeah, we've 
Anyway, well, bit, of, bit of a long-winded comment, but yeah, it's nice to finally, after all these glancing blows, get get a real um, peek behind the curtain. And um, and um, yeah, I would I would echo the comments already. I think our, our programs are um, are extremely complementary um, already as they are, and I think also in terms of um, the direction each of us wants to take over the next. Um, two or three years uh, as you look at handing over the reins. I, I, I think from what you described, they will remain very complimentary. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to a bunch of ways that, that we might interact more over the coming years. Right, yeah. Welcome um, you to you know. come up and visit. I'd be happy to come down there and talk with more folks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we ought to... Um, yeah, make that as much of a, a priority as we can in the relatively near term. Great. So yeah, th thanks again. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Al Allie, did you have another question or is it, um, did I just have your residual hand up? Um, uh, <laughs> any other questions from folks for, for Leslie? Um, I, I, I would like to talk more about um, complementary areas. Um, there's just so much um, that uh, you brought up in your presentation that you know is is relevant in terms of uh, potentially being a feeding ground for us to attract undergrads to flow into graduate programs. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's um, you know uh, our eventual role is to teach CAD A, but also a broader um, um, masters and PhD programs in in uh, the various flavors of oceanography, right? And mm -hmm. and we are um, we just have approved a hydrography concentration in the College of Marine Science, and so, That's so um, that might be a uh, you know if you've got some particularly inspired students that want to go into a graduate program that that we could kind of work as a feeder um system uh, which mm -hmm. i think would be attractive to your students as well and uh and they can get some flavor for usf before they have to make a commitment to it um, yeah, yeah. so that that certainly is a, a potential outcome that you know we'd welcome um and as i said before I, I i think we've got a number of programs on the books right now um uh interestingly uh i just had a conversation with um uh some folks at odyssey marine um, they are uh, in the process of taking the Weatherbird over to the Blake Plateau like this week um, uh. to do some uh, towed video work over there. So um, uh. um, I'll, I'll try to see what they're up to. And, and they were asking me about, you know, what do we know about that place? And I said, well, I've never been over there before, but, uh, uh -huh. you know, um, uh, and they're going to they're going to they have a project to to work in the Ophelia beds there. And so. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the project is, but uh, yeah, there's yeah. million mounds is this huge area of deep sea coral mounds and Lophelia okay. Pertusa are, is the reef building coral. It's amazing. Yeah, it's right on the Gulf Stream, so it provides some challenges. <laughs> yeah, is it is that mostly like 100 meters to 200 meters, something like that? No, or? that's um, more like. Uh, up to 800 meters, but okay, like yeah. 400. So that's, that's extremely deep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and NOAA's got Buku um, surveying activity going on in the Gulf this summer. Um, they're doing right. a lot of, I think the, um, I think the Nancy Foster's down, and also that vessel that they have in New Hampshire is came all the way down to the Gulf to do work out there as well. And so, uh -huh. um, and Thomas Jefferson might be there as well. So uh -huh. there's a lot going on there in terms of coral, coral work. Yeah. Great. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it's amazing how art, artful your work is, you know, and so one of the things that, you know, your thank you slide there is certainly uh, um, uh, reminiscent of that. And uh, it, uh, it, there's a big interest in our university about the intersection between art and science. And that we're actually going to get a faculty person that that w works in the uh, that sort of space. And so this has the possibility to to um, be part of that kind of uh, the arena, you know, so sure. and the very, 3D models you could build. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that would be amazing. Cool stuff. Well, <laughs> um, I won't. Um, we've got five five minutes left. Um, uh, thank you very much, Leslie, for a really entertaining um, and very insightful um, presentation. Um, we learned a lot and hopefully this will result in a, a closer collaboration between the programs. Be wonderful. Yeah. We'd love to do that. Thank you.
Cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, um, thank you. And uh, uh, we'll all give you the uh, ceremonial <laughs> um, remote clap here. If I can <laughs> figure out where it is, you know. Uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> all right. Consider yourself remotely clapped. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, Leslie. All right. Thank you, Sarah, too. Thank you so much.